There was a time when you could just take a quick glance at a game and tell if it was made by the French or not. Obviously this applies to more cultures, but in Europe French games were often seen as particularly peculiar. It's not like you can't find different cultural specificities in video games now, but globalization has definitely led to a blend of sensibilities, at least in the western space. But in the 90s, things were quite different, particularly thanks to companies like Cocktail Vision that valued creative freedom above all else. It's in this atmosphere teams led by individuals like Muriel Tramis and Pierre Gillard could shine and create something like Goblins, where each eye represents one of the goblins you control. It's probably the Frenchest game one could imagine, having weird art style, weird world, weird characters, weird humor, weird puzzles, and weird solutions which included transforming a gopher into a busty, naked lady for the purposes of distraction. Though that was deemed too French for future releases and eventually got censored. In all seriousness, I'm calling it weird and French, but really this just means that Goblins is unique. It has its own bizarre identity that it's not afraid to embrace, and that's a big part of the reason why I still remember many of its environments and approximate solutions, despite not touching the game for more than 25 years, ever since my earlier childhood days. I have fun memories of how almost everyone in my family would participate in trying to figure out how to complete one screen or another. Me, my brother, my sisters, my mother… Without a doubt, Goblins and its sequels could be called one of our favorite family series. Having said that, you might ask, family series? But what about boobs? I don't know, either we had the censored version, or as male pandering as it is, no one really cared about a pair of pixel breasts that randomly show up one time and are never mentioned again. For what it's worth, my family wasn't really prudish when it came to these matters and games, as long as things didn't go too far, I suppose. We did play Leisure Suit Larry 7, after all. But enough about that. Goblins does have a manual which includes a description of the story and some clues regarding what you'll have to do. But in general, thanks to the game's visual storytelling style and simple controls, it's one of those old games where you can just ignore the manual. The game starts with a cutscene where the king gets tortured with a voodoo doll, though everyone thinks that he got cursed, and it's up to us to figure out why and how to save him. On this journey, we'll control three goblins that in some of the in-game texts are called elves for some reason, Asgard, Ignatius and Oops, or Bobo, Hooter and Dwayne if you're from the US. Each has their own specialization defined by their personality. Asgard hits things. Ignatius uses magic. Oops picks up and uses items and it's worth noting there's only one inventory slot. All action happens on a single screen, which includes everything required for completion. Dead ends are impossible, and the screens are never overstuffed with interactive looking objects. This is important because Goblins is largely based on the process of trial and error. Now, traditional puzzle design sensibilities would tell us trial and error is bad. But context is important. Yes, when you don't understand what you have to do, there's 20 items in your inventory, you have to go across 10 available locations and try absolutely every possibility to no avail, sure, it's bad. But that's not the case with goblins. The game can get away with bizarre logic for the sake of humor because the play space is so limited. Every interaction leads to different animations depending on the character, and if the fail results aren't funny to you because you don't like slapstick humor, most of the time they're at least amusing. So on a conceptual level, it doesn't feel annoying to just try different things out to see what happens. And the thing is, as arbitrary as some puzzle solution may feel at first, as you progress through the game, you get a sense of this twisted logic the Goblin's world has. It may feel weird that on the first screen you have to hit a wall, so Shaky Horn would fall, which you then would blow into for a stick to fall that you transform into a pickaxe. Like, what? But then you sort of start intuitively understanding what the game is going for, 
So once you see a stick, a hole and a rock near the platform with that hole, you connect the dots just based on that. And putting the stick in the hole makes a watering can appear, which now that I say it out loud definitely sounds like an innuendo, so you get what you have to do with the plants on the screen. The logic of it all is very gamey, but in Goblins it doesn't feel out of place. There is, however, one mechanic that goes against the whole trial and error grain of the game. Say you understand that you need to use magic on the cloud to make it rain. There are two clouds next to each other. Using magic on one of them makes it rain. Using magic on another causes a lightning to hit your character. Normally, this wouldn't be an issue, a little slapstick and you move on. However, the game has a life bar. And every mistake removes life from that bar. When it gets to zero, you have to restart the screen from scratch. The password save system ensures that when you get to the next screen, you have the same amount of life you had at the end of the last one, which means as you progress there is even less room for error in a game where making errors is pretty much a mandatory part of gameplay. In a way, I sort of get why the mechanic exists. On average, 5 minutes in the worst case scenario 10 is really enough to try everything in a screen out, which means that with 22 screens you would complete the game in 4 hour stops. The life bar ensures that you will need to redo positive solutions before continuing with experimentation, artificially prolonging the gameplay. I suppose it's fair to assume it was an attempt to increase the value proposition of the game's purchase, but it really doesn't help. Luckily, the sequels would move away from this approach. I feel like this blemish is significant enough for the game to feel pretty outdated in our age. Personally, I wasn't that bothered, but I have the advantage of still vaguely remembering a bunch of stuff from my childhood, and even then sometimes I would search for other passwords that would let me continue a level with maximum health. One other little annoying mechanical quirk is that only one goblin can do actions at any single moment. Characters stop midway when you switch them, but this one is definitely not as bothersome as the life meter. Still, even with that in mind, there are reasons to check the game out, particularly if you're interested in old-school adventure games. The art is not only unique thanks to its style, it's very alive. All the time something's happening, even if it's just your characters fiddling around while you're thinking what to do next. The story remains exceedingly simple throughout, even if there is technically a plot twist, but the characterization doesn't feel weak thanks to very creative character designs. Every creature we meet in Goblins is memorable in their own way. There's also some nice music if you're playing the CD version, though weirdly enough I prefer the floppy one which has just the sound effects. Maybe it's because of nostalgia. And while the CD version has some voiceovers, both versions retain the goblinish gibberish which alone is enough to give the whole experience its own charm. All I can say is that with adventure games being pretty big at the time, it's pretty clear why Goblins, with its unique approach to everything really, got popular enough that it received a sequel within a year. But that game deserves its own discussion.